Muito boa tarde a todos os participantes nesta primeira conferência sobre fragilidade dos Estados, dedicada aos recursos naturais, resiliência e desenvolvimento. Uma governação sustentável, transparente, inclusiva e eficaz dos recursos naturais, tais como a água e os oceanos, a terra e as matérias-primas, minerais, petróleo, é fundamental para o desenvolvimento dos países mais frágeis. É exatamente sobre os desafios de assegurar essa governação e sustentabilidade dos recursos naturais que versa o presente painel. Para isso, contamos com a presença de um conjunto diversificado de oradores, quer da sociedade civil, Audrey Gorgon, e Adebayo Olukoshi, quer da Academia, professora Helena Freitas, e professor Van Akshun, quer de uma empresa multinacional petrolífera, Sir John Grant, quer ainda de países em situação de fragilidade, Sua Excelência, o Ministro Adjunto do Afeganistão, Wali Ula Zadran. Estes oradores irão partilhar as experiências dos seus países e organizações, debater os desafios da gestão dos recursos naturais e sugerir abordagens para uma melhor governação nesta área. O painel é moderado pelo jornalista da Lusa, António Pereira Neves, a quem passo a palavra. Muito boa tarde a todos. Bem-vindos a esta tarde de discussão e debate. Temos no palco intervenientes com conhecimento e com intervenção direta neste tema, pelo que o nosso debate poderá ser rico e interessante. Vamos começar com uma intervenção inicial de cada um dos participantes. Temos cinco minutos para cada um. Peço que usem as vossas melhores, os vossos melhores recursos para governar o vosso tempo da melhor maneira possível, de maneira a que possamos uh, uh, progredir. Vou começar por uh, dar a palavra a Adebayo Olukoshi, que é diretor para os, as regiões da África e Ásia Ocidental do, Institu do Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon. I, I was telling our moderator that since this is G7+, plus, the five minutes he's given us can be interpreted as five minutes plus. Um, I, I was planning, but it's... He didn't find it too funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I'll try to respect myself. But, uh, you know, uh, I listened to, to Paul Collier, and in an earlier life, I relished the experience of actually having uh, running debates and disagreements with Professor Collier. When I listened to him this afternoon and found so many points of convergence, I consoled myself that maybe I prefer Sir Collier to Professor Collier. Um, and uh, I would like to start off from one of the points which he made, which is a point that already was provoked in me from the very first panel that discussed a lot about fragility. And that's the message that we need to start from the understanding and take it as our foundational um, uh, thought frame that fragility is a property that is common to all, all states. It's a question of when and how, over time, the points of fragility in any given society or political formation expose themselves. So that in terms of the issues around natural resources, which we are discussing, what that means for me is that I will not favor an approach which attempts to use the category of fragility as a label of stigma, one of the many labels of stigmatization of developing countries. See, in the 1990s into the new millennium, I did an exercise of looking at how in policy and research circles, the African state was characterized. 
I found over 40 adjectives, over 40 adjectives. Weak, unsteady, prebendal, neopatrimonial, all of them conceived in a context of the other, not as an understanding of broad mainstream politics, which might manifest itself in extreme terms in some countries in given contexts, but which nevertheless are not unique properties to those contexts. Flowing from that, I think we need also to set aside notions such as resource costs, blood diamond, conflict diamonds, to the extent to which those concepts mislead us to assume that the resource cost is a fatalistic condition. To that extent, it is totally unhelpful. What I think is important for us to do is that beyond the symptoms and the discontents uh, associated with a poor governance of the natural resource sector in many countries, including those of the G7 plus, and in most of Africa, beyond all of those symptoms, we need to begin to unpack what the root issues are that make it so frequently an occurrence that they are unable to master, both in policy and political terms, the resources which exist within their domains. And I'll suggest that a majority of the solutions which have been proposed, which have been tried, Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, Kimberley Process, pay, publish what you pay, and so on and so forth, however useful they are, don't really touch the root of the problems which we are dealing with. And those issues, in my view, are to be located in the arena of governance. Governance not understood simply in terms of good governance, because you know the attributes that the World Bank and others have associated with the concept of good governance, but more broadly, in terms of the process and dynamic associated with nation and state building, and elements of which Paul Collier touched upon, one of the most important of which when he defended the idea of government is for me a robust and coherent civil service. Because if you don't have a coherent institution of policy making that is able not only to act in the short term, but also think for the long haul, then you are going to just basically live from experiment to experiment. And that for me is the heart of the problem which confronts many countries on the African continent. We can try to build capacity here and there, and that has its place. The domain of natural resource also requires very highly specialist skills. We can try to train more negotiators. We've done it. That also has its place. But in the absence of a systemic framework represented by a functioning state of which the civil service is at the heart, then in the end for me, we are going to be chasing shadows. We might move one step forward, but it only requires the change of one government or the change of one minister for you to move five steps backward at the end of the day. And finally, all of the initiatives that are outlined in trying to improve natural resource governance across Africa and in many of the other so-called fragile states really come in a piecemeal fashion. They come piecemeal, you know, do transparency. You do that for five years. Get the same Kimberley process certificate. You do that for another five years. Publish what you pay. You do that for another five years. There isn't an integrated and comprehensive approach which actually exploits the connectivity amongst the different initiatives. And that, again, for me, speaks to the fact that we don't have a coherent and cohesive policy institutional process that enables 
many of the resource-rich countries to think and to act on a long-term basis with the necessary administrative and technocratic savvy that will enable them to maximize resources. Five minutes, thank you. Well, a little over five, but uh, thank you. <laughs> Continuing on with... Uh... Audrey Goran from the uh, Natural Resources Governance Institute. Thanks very much, and I'd like to thank the organizers. I'm very honored to have been invited to speak. So what I'm gonna do is just share five quick thoughts that come from working with colleagues who are working in natural resource-rich countries around the world, and things that they have brought forward as observations that might be helpful to, to the discussion. So I'd ask these colleagues, what are the kind of things you would like to see happen, that you wish had happened in your context um, that would prevent some of the more negative impacts of natural resource wealth in your country? One of the key ones was the early decisions. What are the early decisions and how are they made and how are the systems and structures put in place? And this very much goes to the point about the civil service. Mm -hmm. Having a strong civil service, but also looking at where do you get the advice that you need to put in place the tax structure, the cadaster, the licensing systems, all of the things that will be important to ensure that the country gets the best deal possible from its natural resources. And that expertise is not as common as we would wish it was, so there's a question of where does it come from. Um, and the bad experiences are those where it comes from, for example, the corporations who are looking to get access to the resources also ending up being the ones who provide the government with advice on how to manage the resources because there are clear conflicts of interest. Better examples include recently Ghana asked both Mexico and Lebanon to provide it with direct experience, direct peer-to-peer -peer learning on their licensing system. Send your civil servants to us and let, it, let them help us with our licensing um, rollout. So we have to think about where, do, where does the advice that countries need, particularly at the start of the journey, come from? How do you avoid bad deals? And what is the role of those international actors who frequently, when a country discovers natural resources in any significant quantity, enter the country and can be benign or not so benign, and can generate bad deals that then hang around the country as an obstacle for, for many years to come. Some of you will remember um, the case in Liberia just after the armed conflict um, where Mittal negotiated a deal with a government just emerging from armed conflict and the deal was found to be fairly egregiously in favor of the company having taken advantage of the context. These are the kind of contexts we need to bring more to the fore and ask who is providing the advice and input and is it impartial and to go to a theme that was raised earlier, is it the right advice for the country in the context? Another issue that um, was raised in a number of countries was debt. Um, I actually spoke to a senior civil servant in a new producer oil country who said that one of her shocks when the country discovered oil was she opened her office door and there was a queue of international bankers standing outside waiting to throw money at her. Not the Ministry of Finance, not the central bank, just at her because she held that position. And the debt potential, or the potential to rack up debt, can be a significant obstacle and can be an issue that confronts a country in the early stages. And it's often linked to another issue, which is expectations, the expectation of the population. And, and Professor Collier uh, um, explained this very well earlier with the example of Botswana, the temptation in many cases is to overpromise, and the population, citizens, start to think, where's the money, where's it going? We expect development and, and things to happen right now, when in reality, the timeframes over which the rents and the revenues come in can be significantly longer, and mismatched expectations can lead to a lot of disaffectation, civil unrest, et cetera. And one other point in relation to early decisions was the impact on extraction-affected communities which is too often taken account of after extraction has started, when there is difficulty and trouble, as opposed to bringing those communities on board far earlier in the process. Second quick point, colleagues in the Institute have been looking at the law and policy gap that exists, and this goes, I think, to a point that was raised by a number of speakers about whether advice 
is fit for purpose or whether some in the international community are lifting and shifting solutions that work in one place but won't work in another context. So in a, in a review of laws on natural resource governance, um, colleagues at the Institute discovered a gap between the laws that exist and the implementation of those laws and began looking at why that was. Some are put in place for political reasons, but there's no political commitment to the laws. They're put in place maybe to achieve certain donor thresholds, which is problematic in itself. Others are well-meaning, well-intentioned, putting in place the perfect law, but forgetting about how that law could be implemented. And one of the lessons learned there is bringing the implementers on board as soon as possible when laws are being developed. So there's an understanding built into the legal development system about how that law will be rolled out in reality. And this raised another interesting issue that, that comes up in, 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 across a number of countries, which is cooperation across government departments and frequently finding that a range of government departments that are involved and influential in managing natural resources don't actually talk to each other. So the auditors don't talk to the Ministry of Petroleum or the Ministry of Mining. They don't talk to the state-owned national oil company. And there's gaps in information that could easily be filled by better cooperation and dialogue and communication between um, government actors who are working on the same issue with the aim of, of better governance of the resources. Briefly, I'd like to say something on the issue of climate change and decision making in relation to particularly hydrocarbons. Um, the issue of climate change was raised earlier. But one of the issues facing countries, particularly those who are new producers of hydrocarbons, is where the world is going in terms of demand, where the market is going for, for hydrocarbons, and what decisions you make now can in fact affect the country's economic future for years, if not decades, to come. So taking account of, for example, not necessarily investing a very large amount in a national oil company and hoping to get a return over decades when there may not be that return coming to the country. So thinking about where the world is going and how that affects the policy choices the country makes now, but also how to avoid fossil fuel rich countries, hydrocarbon rich countries, being left behind in the energy transition. Because if the focus is too much on the hydrocarbons, that could mean that energy transition, which is the future, is not taken account of in policy decisions. And this is not at all to say that countries that are rich in, uh, hydrocarbons, developing economies rich in hydrocarbons should be keeping it in the ground. I very much agree with, with what Professor Collier said in that regard earlier. One final point. Most of the issues that I just mentioned are relevant for countries at the start of their journey, at the start of their natural resource governance journey. But what about the countries that for decades have had entrenched significant challenges around natural resources? What can be done there? And there's often a temptation to think nothing can be done, and I don't believe that that's true. Two issues that we've looked at. One is how do you work with reformers, even if it's one lone person, in civil society, in the government, in a ministry, in the civil service? How do reformers get a chance to build reform outwards from the inside? But the other is where the international community, and international, not donor international community, international cooperation is important. And that's in regard to law enforcement. The kind of entrenched problems in some natural resource rich countries that have been there for decades are not problems just inside the country. They are facilitated and enabled massively by actors outside the country who enable money to be siphoned off in massive amounts, hidden in tax havens, and laundered through various systems. A few years ago, I attended a conference of international law enforcers looking at diamond smuggling. And there were people from multiple jurisdictions, um, countries rich in diamonds, countries to which diamonds had been smuggled or to which the proceeds had been smuggled. And one thing that was noticeable around that table of, of resource governance actor or law enforcement actors was every one of them had a piece of the picture and they knew it was a serious picture involving millions if not billions of dollars, but they had no way of cooperating with each other to bring to account those people who were enabling and facilitating the pilfering of, of tens of millions, if not billions of dollars. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Professor Helena Freitas, you're welcome.
Eu volto a apelar aos nossos participantes para uh, manterem as suas intervenções iniciais. Uh, Pode fazer gás? Como quiser, uh, por tradução simultânea. I mean, Portugal, I feel that I should speak in Portuguese, if you don't mind. Com certeza. Eu queria também agradecer o, o convite para, para estar aqui neste, penso que é uma, um evento de particular importância e especialmente nos dias de hoje e eu sinto a responsabilidade de estar aqui em representação também do universo da ciência e da academia que se envolve nestas matérias cada vez mais numa perspectiva holística, portanto olhando de facto para o planeta no seu conjunto e tentando perceber como é que o consegue tornar mais harmonioso na perspectiva de que importa, de facto, preservar o planeta e, e, e a sua harmonia numa uh, estreita ligação, evidentemente, com as comunidades, com as, as pessoas que nele habitam. E, nesse sentido, também, uh, vivemos tempo de, tempos de grande... Portanto, não vou orientar tanto para os recursos naturais aqui, digamos, para esta questão muito particular do... Do, do petróleo, do, enfim, da, das, deste tipo de recursos que tipicamente nestes contextos eu percebo que sejam mais relevantes, mas na perspectiva também da segurança alimentar, da identidade, da biodiversidade, do que tudo isto significa também eh, pensando globalmente no planeta. E de facto vivemos tempos de grande incerteza. Eh, tempos de grande incerteza quando herdamos, apesar de tudo, uma história longa de 4.6 mil milhões de anos de uma terra que se tornou cada vez mais complexa, mas que de facto precisa, que tem um conjunto de mecanismos que promovem a sua estabilidade, portanto há uma teia de relações dessa mesma complexidade que permitem que hoje possamos olhar com alguma tranquilidade ainda para as interações entre a Terra, o oceano e o clima. Portanto, isto são dinâmicas que exigem alguma, alguma digamos, algum nível de estabilidade que claramente hoje percebemos que estamos a viver um momento muito particular da história da nossa Terra, deste nosso planeta. E esta história, de facto, passa, que é uma herança também de milhões de anos, como eu dizia, de acumulação de solos, por exemplo, solos que não pensamos, mas que nos garantem práticas agrícolas, o ciclo da água, que nos garantem, enfim, tantas outras, tantos outros serviços que, de facto, precisamos, mas pensar também na biodiversidade, e no próprio clima, que de facto se tem mantido relativamente estável, mas que recentemente sabemos, e particularmente nos últimos 200 anos, há de facto uma alteração profunda também deste clima com eh, consequências. Eu não vou, evidentemente, falar sobre estas questões, são questões que não, não importam aqui, não, têm, não terão a relevância, mas têm neste sentido. Nós vivemos tempos de uma grande incerteza, em que o risco é muito maior e é coletivamente em cada um destes países. Portanto, aquilo que hoje é de facto dado por garantido, não tem necessariamente que ser assim. Portanto, quando a equação dos recursos naturais também não pode sair fora desta, desta dinâmica, que é de facto uma dinâmica que a própria ciência hoje tem que aprender a gerir, a mitigar e a encontrar a adaptação que também precisamos. Portanto, não é também uma equação necessariamente simples. Mas agora, evidentemente, que também, para deixar a coisa muito clara, é evidente que a humanidade pode viver fora destes limites. Podemos encontrar outros níveis, outros estados de estabilidade em que podemos eh, claramente viver. Mas eh, esta, esta instabilidade, esta incerteza, que suscita naturalmente também nas próprias, nas comunidades, nos países, portanto, que de facto, já em si, quaisquer países, não apenas aqueles que estamos aqui a falar, quaisquer países hoje têm eh, que eh, se interrogam, se interpelam e não sabem, não têm as respostas, portanto, são de facto incertezas que nos tocam a todos, não é? e portanto nesse sentido também há aqui um momento de oportunidade para pensarmos coletivamente a forma como nos organizamos e olhamos uh, para uh, os, uh, digamos, o planeta nos seus diferentes contextos, como dizia, da atmosfera, dos oceanos, da Terra, não é? e portanto isto é uma, uma exigência que também nos é, portanto, não só pela incerteza climática, mas pela própria alteração demográfica, que é profunda, que tem também profundas implicações. Portanto, ao nível, designadamente, da segurança alimentar, que, é, que, que de facto não será também uma questão fácil de garantir. Portanto, a verdade é que esta incerteza nos obriga a pensar a resiliência. Como é que nós garantimos a resiliência daquilo que são os recursos 
dos quais precisamos para o mínimo bem-estar, mas também como é que governamos e preparamos a resiliência daquilo que são os recursos naturais que hoje estamos aqui a falar. Também nada disto é garantido. Portanto, de facto, infelizmente, digamos, a maior parte do pensamento político sobre estas questões parte de um princípio de estabilidade que não é rigorosamente assim. Portanto, globalmente, era mesmo necessário, independentemente, eu sei que as questões mais importantes são aquelas que depois chocam diariamente com a preparação dos governos, a preparação das comunidades, a mobilidade até, a migração das comunidades, portanto, em função da disponibilidade destes mesmos recursos, eu percebo que seja assim, mas a verdade é que, mesmo à escala internacional, de facto, não temos ainda nenhuma entidade que, de facto, tenha uma responsabilidade legitimada sobre, digamos, estas certezas e a preparação desta incerteza. Enfim, temos painéis, temos as Nações Unidas, naturalmente, mas não há, digamos, nenhum tipo de organização que nos prepare e que, prepare e que nos prepare para essa... Portanto, a todos os níveis, eu julgo que precisamos também da criação destas estruturas que, de facto, comecem a preparar a equação de outra, de outra forma. E, portanto, eu sei que, enfim, as pessoas que aqui estão têm no seu dia-a-dia -dia seguramente mais intervenção do que eu, mas eu gostava de chamar a atenção para dois ou três aspectos, para além, digamos, desta questão da incerteza e, de facto, da ausência de entidades que, a um nível supragovernamental, possam, de facto, trazer inspiração, até inspiração para as políticas públicas e, portanto, que, que nos coloquem mais em sintonia, em harmonia, em diálogo, porque, de facto, o tempo da fragmentação acabou, porque a própria Terra não permite que ele continue. Não podemos continuar a perpetuar o isolamento, o individualismo, o posicionamento fragmentado, não é possível. Não é possível porque a própria Terra nos ensina que o seu nível de complexidade hoje exige respostas coletivas, exige parcerias, exige, de facto, o trabalho conjunto. E as políticas também têm que ir neste caminho. Eu gostava de deixar duas outras mensagens que me preocupam, em particular, no imediato. E que têm a ver com esta questão, de facto, os chamados enfim, estados mais frágeis e que tem a ver com, em primeiro lugar, a questão dos dados, da informação. Eu julgo que uma forma eficaz ou relativamente eficaz de, de tornarmos mais rápida a, a percepção de que é preciso criar esta, este olhar global é a informação disponível de forma transparente Uh, uh, e portanto que eu sei que é difícil não é fácil, isto, eu sei que isto é uma matéria de alguma sensibilidade mas a produção de dados a disponibilidade de dados sobre também os recursos naturais eu sei que isto tem algumas, alguma suscetibilidade mas precisamos disso precisamos de uh, uh, e precisamos de também que em todos os países esta, esta literacia exista portanto que seja de facto possível trabalhar a sua própria informação. Penso que é um nível de literacia mais urgente em qualquer país, porque muitas vezes, infelizmente e muito frequentemente, a informação relativa aos recursos naturais dos, dos diferentes países não está nos países, não está nesses países. Está exatamente noutras entidades que usam, evidentemente, esses, esse, essa informação, que não a disponibilizam frequentemente para os países de onde, de onde vão buscar esses mesmos recursos e eu penso que isso era da maior urgência conseguirmos programas capazes de capacitar os países de uma, forma, de uma forma geral relativamente à informação, às bases de dados e à disponibilidade de dados. E outro aspecto que eu gostava de chamar a atenção é que tipicamente não é, é necessidade, penso eu, hoje no, na, na, quando se perspectiva a própria, a própria ajuda ao desenvolvimento, as chamadas as ajudas ao desenvolvimento, que se comece a equacionar na, na, nesse, nesses eh, programas que tenham maior amplitude. Programas, digamos, que sejam orientados, por exemplo, à Agenda 2030, os objetivos da Agenda 2030. E são, então, alguns eh, objetivos são, também, são estratégicos nestes países. Mas, enfim, o objetivo, eu, enfim, apenas alguns, o objetivo 7, energia limpa. Se conseguíssemos associar aos programas de apoio ao desenvolvimento, em vez, tantas vezes, de fazermos a partilha por via dos financiamentos, se conseguíssemos associar programas de longo prazo que identifiquem uh, os objetivos dos ADS, como por exemplo estes, energias limpas, nós podemos fazer uma diferença enorme. 
pela, pela implementação deste tipo de objetivos, falo deste, falo do, do 13, alterações climáticas, do 12, tão importante sobre o consumo responsável e a produção, são, são de facto, no fundo, estes objetivos são linhas programáticas que, do meu ponto de vista, faziam todo o sentido e são da maior pertenência quando incorporados, digamos, nas dinâmicas de apoio internacional, muito dirigidas, mas que frequentemente, digamos, não têm uma linha programática sólida, portanto, consistente, longo prazo, que de facto promova a tal transição energética e a transição que nós de facto precisamos. Portanto, isto foi uma mensagem muito preliminar, eu ficaria por aqui. Muito obrigado. Obrigado, professora. John, from Anadarko Petroleum, we are keen to hear your opening remarks. Thank you, thank you, Antonio. And, and like the other panelists, I'm very grateful for the invitation to be here on on what's discussing what's a very important subject. Um, I guess my qualification for being on this very distinguished panel is that after a career mostly in the public sector, I've spent the last 12 years working for different extractive companies. Australian, British, and American in that order, all of which had interests in Africa and the developing world. And I just wanted to make five uh, general observations about what I think can and can't be expected of companies, international companies, generally Western companies, and then end on one note of um, optimism in what's often a rather pessimistic area. Um, so the five observations are as follows. First, uh, it, it's not realistic to expect uh, private sector companies not to prioritize the interests of their shareholders. Uh, that can seem occasionally rather a stark and brutal statement, but that's the nature of the economic system we have. And uh, companies will continue to do that. The important thing, I think, for those of you who hold companies to account is to demand that they should do so in a long-term and realistic way. Because that is a less brutal and stark way of looking at that issue. And I'll come to that point in a moment. The second thing everyone should, of course, expect is that companies abide by their legal obligations in the country they're operating in and the other obligations that apply to them, as, for instance, apply to American and British companies because of legislation their home governments have. And there can be no debate about that. That's black and white and very simple. The third point, and this brings me back to my first point about shareholder interests, is that companies should understand what it takes to run a successful long-term business, particularly a resources business, in a developing country. Uh, I, I don't like um, the expression social license to operate very much. I think license to operate is fundamentally important. I think the definition is a little narrow, and I prefer to think in terms of license to operate, both as a local obligation, imperative, if you like, that companies have, but also as a national obligation. Because uh, if, and I come back to the company's shareholders and investors now, you, I believe very strongly that if you want to run a successful, sustainable, long-term business which manages its risks effectively and thus protects the interests of your shareholders, you have to understand that your presence in whatever country you're working in has to be seen to be aligned with the interests of the people who live in that country. And that applies to local communities, it applies to local businesses on the issue of local content, it applies to the citizens of the country as a whole, uh, it applies on specific issues. Uh, the company I work in is in has started recently a resettlement project. Uh, this will be scrutinized rightly very carefully. We have to get it right because successful resettlement will determine whether or not people have trust and confidence in us. 
Linked to that, I think companies should be ready to build a relationship of trust and partnership with the government of the country where they're working. And I agree very much with Audrey that the idea that it's clever and helps the long-term interests of your shareholders to go in and do what will be seen in the long term as a bad deal for the government and the people of the country where you are is a bad idea. Uh, finally, and this is, uh, I agree very much with most, nearly everything. I'll come to the one small area of disagreement I had with Paul Collier in a moment, but what he said was, of course, masterful and very important. The real key to all of this is good public sector governance, and that's not what companies do. We run businesses, we don't run governments. We have to show that we understand the importance of good public sector governance as the key to long-term solutions, but not pretend it's our business, because it isn't. Finally, in my note of optimism, uh, and my disagreement with Paul, it's only a small disagreement. So, of course, ESG investors get it wrong, because the environmental, social, and governance investor community is still learning. But what it shows is that, in a way, investor-driven business is changing, because it's becoming sensitive to issues that 10 years it wasn't sensitive to. Now, it may not be exactly sensitive in exactly the right way, but what that means is that businesses are also changing. And one of the reasons they're changing is because the power of citizens, in my view, the power of social media, the disruption of trust between electorates and governments, which is becoming a, generally seen as a major problem, and an understanding on the part of the most enlightened investors that if the money that they invest is going to be looked after properly, the companies that they invest in have to help build that relationship of trust with the broader populations. So it's not perfect, but it's an important step forward and one I think we should all encourage. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, John. Thank you. Next up, Professor Jun Vanak. University of Cambodia. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, indeed for the G7 Plus and the government of Portugal for inviting me to this uh, event. Uh, touching upon the environmental governance for the sustainability, I would like to raise a couple of points from Cambodia part. Uh, from the legal part, it's the Cambodia specified in, specified in its constitution, Article 58 and 59, to manage the natural resources either underground on the surface and the air, clean air, clean land, clean water. This principle mainstream into policy that the, uh, and also the, the, the law on the natural resources management 906 under the Ministry of Environment in uh, cooperation and partnership with all the institutions in Cambodia. And the mainstreaming this uh, legal requirement into uh, the policy, I would say the First of all, I raised the example of the uh, Green Growth Roadmap of Cambodia 2010. That's the, the success of that Green, green Growth Roadmap, stressed on the seven axes with the engagement of the people on the ground. One is the access to uh, renewable energy, energy and efficiency, access to natural uh, resources, the, the, particularly the water and uh, uh, fishery and of course forestry and so on, access to finance and investment and to access to information and to the access to the sustainable transport and, and so on. As the most vital points that the Cambodia has uh, conducting the coherent policy on the inclusive growth. They, for example, like uh, since the, the, the Rio Plus 20 launched the, uh, the particularly the United Nations launched the Rio Plus 20 outcome documents. Cambodia has tapped on that to develop the policy on green growth and the National Strategic Plan on Green Growth 2013 2030. This outlined the, the seven axes of the previous uh, roadmap and 
It's a uh, stress on the harmonization of development activities with nature, the coexistence of the human being and the nature, uh, really in line with the harmony with nature resolution of Cambodia with the United Nations, uh, the resolution on the harmony with nature. And uh, the, the pursuit of the green civilization as specified in the Cambodia Constitution's uh, Article 58 and 59. And uh, I would like to raise the, be, beside the, so the policy coherence in the government mandate from one to another every five years, as well as the strategic development plan. That's really uh, 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 point out the necessity that the, the awareness must be there. The, the issue, I would like to raise the challenges that uh, the, the limited understanding of the policy and the law the requirement, particularly the, who destroy the natural resources the most is the company. The company often got the complaint from the people and the government could not do anything. And, uh, but with the social, the power of social media, particularly Facebook and all that, it exposed any corrupt official re regarding or the, the company uh, in, in every case, even at the moment. Those would be arrested and uh, uh, the public opinion from the Facebook and the other type of social media is the best and, and, and help them to be accountable uh, in front of the citizen. They, we even have, we call uh, natural resource citizen journalists. And that's the, so they can do the report and with this. And uh, the last point, the example that uh, the I would like to raise is the corporate social responsibility. Because we have the right enabling environment from the policy coherence to the strategy and then the, like the Aeon Mall. Uh, I have asked the CEO of the Aeon Mall of Japan uh, why they distribute plastic back for free. And then the CEO come back that, okay, I will do something. And then the, the next couple of months they come back with the price on the back and then so the consumer before taking the plastic and throw away they consider you know you need to bring the plastic back uh, from home uh, other type of bag renew uh, the biodegradable bag to the shop and then come back and 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 and, and become more cost effective and cost efficient the last example i want to give as the the technology, Cambodia has been the most liberalized uh, uh, in the finance account. And that's it allowed the technological company, like uh, particularly the mobile phone applications, to transfer any payment to see any natural resources information so that for data reliability, the people can get involved with that. And uh, I thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Last but not least, our distinguished guest from Afghanistan, Wali Zadran, please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would also like uh, to thank you, G7 Plus and the government of Portugal uh, for inviting us, um, um, uh, a representative of a country which has uh, suffered more than four decades of war. And it's indeed a post-conflict country which is now focusing on state building and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sustainable development, a uh, major part of which is uh, formed by the governance of the mineral resources. Uh, I think uh, since morning uh, we have talked uh, in terms of what shall be done um, um, to have a proper governance of the mining sector or mineral or natural resources. Uh, and also we have talked about the challenges. So uh, I would like to uh, focus more on what we have done in Afghanistan since last 18 years, uh, so that at least we understand that all what was discussed since morning, I think I personally, on behalf of the ministry, agrees with all those issues and suggestions as well as the challenges. Uh, and I think they are very important in a, in a, in a country which has experienced war uh, for more than uh, four decades. Uh, according to me, the natural resources, particularly the mining and oil and gas uh, governance is like a coin 
which has two sides, one side of which is bliss and the other side of which is curse. So, and the essential uh, driving factors in the mining governments, according to me, is uh, uh, security, standard legal and policy frameworks, uh, transparency and accountability, and uh, importantly, the investments. I think these are the essential factors, uh, the governance of which can uh, take us either to the bliss or to the curse. Uh, when it comes to the Afghanistan, uh, I would like to uh, uh, provide information that how we are governing the mining sector in three parts. Uh, one, what we were 17 years ago. Uh, before that, let me tell you that Afghanistan has more than one trillion uh, worth of deposits, uh, resources. Uh, this has been surveyed by the United States Geolo uh, Geological Survey and uh, we have these uh, deposits. Uh, but uh, after the collapse of the Taliban regime back in 2001, 2002, we had a Ministry of Mines, but there were zero investments. We didn't have a proper legal framework, we didn't have policies, we didn't have uh, this uh, security was a big challenge at that time, even it's a challenge now as well, but uh, to a great extent it has been solved and that does not apply to everywhere where the mineral deposits and resources are uh, there. The involvement of the warlords and, uh, and the insurgents was another big issue that we were facing at that time and still we are facing it to a certain extent. Uh, two, what we are now, uh, now, uh, after working for almost uh, 17 years, uh, for the first time since last three years, we have a mining roadmap or a roadmap for mining sector, which uh, guides us, uh, uh, you know, where are our areas of interest? Uh, you know, uh, what are our uh, uh, prioritized minerals? For example, we more focus on industrial minerals and primary metals, uh, then we go to the rare earth uh, uh, minerals and the other, um, uh, other minerals. Uh, we have uh, reform strategies, we have now uh, a complete legal framework of law uh, and regulations and guidelines which are not only uh, in accordance with the international standards uh, which, were which were not only developed in consultation with the international donors community, with the civil society, uh, organizations and uh, in consultation with the local people as well as the private sector, but also uh, provide us a, a licensing regime which clearly tells us you know, uh, how to proceed with the different uh, type of the mining projects. Uh, beside that, uh, we, have, uh, we are having a very good amount of investment now in Afghanistan. Uh, um, uh, the, the projects that we have undertaken since last at least five years and we will be, uh, we will be taking, uh, that's uh, bringing to us uh, more than 300 uh, million uh, US dollars investment to Afghanistan. And I think that's an achievement in a country uh, which has experienced um, uh, four decades of war. Uh, if you look at our revenue back in uh, 2015, uh, from the revenue from the mining sector was only uh, 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 half a million of AFs, that's our currency. But now it has uh, increased to 2.7 billion AFs uh, per year. Uh, that's the uh, re revenue that we get from the uh, different taxes, uh, royalties, surface rents, and other non-tax uh, non revenues in the mining sector. But at the same time, there are, so, so why, why I conveyed this was that you know, uh, the issues that we'll be, we'll be discussing uh, uh, since morning, I think these are very important issues. Look, I think that you know, when we have natural resources, you know, we should utilize them. You know, we should not keep it. We, can, we, we cannot say that, okay, let's keep it for now once I have the expertise once I have the institutions like properly the way I want because that's the government is saying so, uh, you know, then I'll, I'll go for investment and traction and I'll, I'll give it for exploitation and all. Because here we should think about our, you know, our family and children as Professor Paul said, not as uh, the individuals that, who are currently working in the government. Uh, so that's the reason that I said, but still 
there are uh, uh, certain of challenges, and one of the main challenges being here is the illegal mining. Uh, and that's the reason because we are a post-war country and we have three tires of um, uh, illegal mining in our country. The first tire being the artisanal mining, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is done by the local people uh, who, do, who doesn't have jobs, uh, who don't have jobs and f just for the sake of their, uh, uh, their uh, householding issues, they're doing this mining. Uh, so the second category is the mining, which is done by the warlords. Uh, some of the warlords that are still uh, you know, powerful in some regions of Afghanistan, they involve this. And the third one, the third category is uh, by the insurgents. Uh, uh, which, so that's the reason that why I was talking about the essential uh, uh, driving factors in mining governments, I, I, I made the security factor as the first factor because in such countries where they have experienced war, security is very important. Uh, you know, most of the revenue, uh, I won't say like a huge amount, but some amount of the revenue now goes to the insurgents in Afghanistan, and that's the resources that, you know, you know they're, they're uh, supporting their uh, uh, unlawful activities. So these are the um, uh, challenges, uh, and I think not only in Afghanistan, these can be challenges in other post-war countries as well, uh, which I think uh, uh, you know we uh, we need to focus on those issues apart from the environmental and social aspects of the e mining. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Well, we have more or less uh, thirty minutes to continue this debate. I would like to ask some pointed questions arising from your interventions. Uh, Adebayo, um, what does your organization uh, do in, in order to make fragile states uh, be in a position of strength rather than a position of weakness when uh, negotiating and dealing with their natural resources as a source of income for their populations? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in answering that, I would like to also engage in a conversation with uh, colleagues on the panel. Sure. And, and I would like to, to, to tap into the point which you made, John, uh, with regard to the core interest of uh, mining companies, uh, which is to advance the shareholder interest in an enlightened way uh, that is sustainable. Um, I think. The, 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 the issue for me is that the extent to which or the manner in which that plays out actually varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And it varies with examples like the windfall tax that Australia, for example, applied at the time when resource prices went through the roof, uh, and for which not a single African country was able to levy a similar tax with the basic narrative, over arcing narrative, that if you do that, you will discourage foreign investors. Okay, the foreign investors were not discouraged in Australia with windfall tax. But in Africa in, or in Canada, the essential narrative becomes a race to the bottom. A race to the bottom in which, even as prices soar through the roof, a country like Zambia finds itself subsidizing companies and the companies become the biggest eaters of subsidy of any actor in the economy and society. And, and I think this goes back to the issues of governance, which we need to take seriously. Now, in the context of what we try to do in International Idea, uh, for the last five or so years, we've participated in the annual mining in Daba in Cape Town, where we bring together parliamentarians and ministers of mining around how to domesticate a framework which has been adopted at the level of the African Union, and which for me, arguably, is perhaps the most radical and comprehensive framework the Pan-African body has ever adopted, known as the African Mining Vision. And it's a, it's a vision, it's a framework adopted at the level of heads of state. Uh, but which, you know, like many other things adopted by a, an intergovernmental organization, um, runs the risk of simply being put on the shelf and forgotten, unless you make a proactive effort to at least get a number of key players and lead countries 
to begin to unpack it and use it in their relationship, whether they are beginning, uh, as in Ghana, for example, or they are older in the game, as in South Africa, uh, to see how in the application of the mining vision uh, from the point of negotiation all through to the uh, point of uh, the kinds of domestic value addition uh, which should be flowing uh, from the extraction of resources, they are able to make much more. And the point which we also emphasize is that taxation has its place. It's important that you tax and get the maximum benefit uh, out of the operations of the mining companies. And honest companies will pay their taxes. But the issue is much more than that. It's not simply a matter of taxing, but negotiating in a way in which you can have the necessary backward and forward linkages. But that's the lesson of Botswana. And that's the incomplete part of the story which Paul Collier told. Because the issue in Botswana today is no longer about maximizing revenues. They've done everything. It's 50-50 sharing from the beginning. There was no back and forth about it, 50-50. Whatever comes out of it, you take 50, we keep 50. But today, President Masisi repeatedly saying that well, we also want what they do in Antwerp with our diamonds to be done locally in Haborone. Let's also begin to polish the diamonds in Haborone. Because in any case, in another two, three decades, Botswana's diamond reserves will be exhausted. And what does Botswana do? It needs to move up the value chain. It needs to be able to uh, invest. And those are the kinds of things which we try to bring to the attention. What employment is being generated? What type of employment? How does this connect with your national development plan for industrialization? Um, how does this link up to your educational system? What about transportation and railway? So that the mining sector should cease to be an enclave that is isolated onto itself and have greater fit through to the rest of the economy in a benign and positive way that can actually then make for a sustainable win-win outcome for both the mining companies and the host countries and communities. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. John, you are the sole corporate voice in this panel. Mm -hmm. um, is the interest of shareholders somehow incompatible with the sustainability of an operation? Uh, when you go into a fragile state, uh, do you take into consideration the need for a, an ethical backbone to your uh, operation in that country? Well, I think that, that unfortunately, one of the enormous challenges for fragile states is that in many cases, many companies would consider that while a state is fragile, I, mean, I don't like the word very much either, but I think we all know roughly what it means. Yes. They will be reluctant to, they will regard the level of political risk as being too high to invest. Mm. So this comes back to the, the need to deploy responsibly shareholder capital. And it, it, it should not be, in my view, the job of the private sector to remedy that situation because that's not our core business. It's not our core activity. I, I do, however, think, uh, believe very strongly that it's, it's not only compatible with the interests of shareholders that companies should act in a sustainable and ethical way, but but partly for the reasons our, our colleague from Cambodia expressed so well, it's become a necessary part of responsible stewardship of your shareholders' resources. Because if you don't behave ethically and you don't behave sustainably, uh, popular opposition and political opposition to your activities will grow so strong mm. that in some way your operations will be disrupted or interrupted. Um, uh, and that is, to a significant extent, a function, this is a much bigger and a very interesting discussion, a function of the changing nature of modern politics and the way that grassroots and minorities who are active working with civil society and non-governmental organizations who have a vital role to play can change things quite significantly. So, um, 
if I could just come back to um, uh, a, a related point about all of this, I think that that uh, the the question of the question of whether long-term successful sustainable growth is possible without foreign investment is part of the part of that. I don't. I think the evidence is that despite the massive transfer of resources by the public sector international donor community in many countries and the efforts of a large number of expert and very committed people uh, without uh, a strong private sector long-term sustainable dynamic growth is much harder to achieve so it's a partnership um, uh, but is is there a, is there a set of circumstances in which it's ever legitimate for companies to behave unethically or th or short term? No, there isn't. Absolutely not. Categorically not. Thank you, John. Audrey, uh, can we really ask these peoples that have been out of the loop of this cycle of generating wealth with oil and uh, and uh, finite resources? Can we really ask them to transition to cleaner energy, to investment in, in other kinds of, uh, of energy without them having benefit from, benefited from the profits of this uh, other older cycle that we are thinking about replacing? Well, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's about, actually, it's about things like backward and forward linkages, horizontal linkages, and how countries think about diversifying their energy sources and diversifying their economy and using the rents, the revenues from the existing non-renewable resources in order to achieve that, rather than focusing on these resources and not seeing where the energy situation is going. Because the last thing you want to do is wake up in 20 years' time and feel like you actually are now 20 years behind all of the countries that have made energy transition. So it's about looking at how the revenues that you're getting now, and therefore using them. It's not a case of not using them, but how can they future-proof your country and give your country the best chance in what is a changing future? And if you don't look at that, then, then the, the, the real risk is that fossil fuel-rich countries get left behind again, and that's the risk that needs to be avoided. But it isn't, it's about energy transition, but it's also about the energy matrix in a country and economic diversification, and they are complex policy issues. And I think this is the kind of decision making that is vital to consider. And again, it goes back to how do you get the policy advice you need to make those decisions now, such that you've set the country up well for the long term, rather than just setting it up for the short term. Professor Jun. Uh you belong to uh, uh, an association, a regional association of countries in Asia. Is there a regional solidarity, considering that maybe the countries that belong to it have similar problems? Uh, for the ASEAN, uh, it's very pluralistic. They face uh, on the environmental issue, the lack of the uh, interstate cooperation, like for the for example, like the haze happening in Indonesia affecting the air of the Malaysia and Singapore. And then the, the, these two countries could not do anything by as in charter and the, as in way in the, the article of uh, uh, article of one, article one in the purpose, that's the, the non-intervention from state member. But the environmental issue regarding the air and the water pollution, the transboundary, become a challenge because there's no multilateral agreement on, on the, the settlement of the, any type of transboundary issue, either air or the uh, uh, contaminated water, uh, particularly the Mekong. The Mekong River, the 1995, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the agreement, it's, it is there, but each member states try yes. to build that dam for the electricity purpose mm -hmm. and the development need. And then they, they, we have the exchange like the, uh, uh, Japan, Mekong, and uh, Korea, Mekong, 
and the U.S. Mekong, they raise a lot of number of issues. If you keep doing competing on them building for electricity need, hmm. they, they, the Mekong River Basin would be wiped out like uh, Miss, Mississippi. So, and that's the, and uh, another point of the, the challenges is the forest fire. For example, like each time during the period of drought, the forest fire pick up, in Cambodia, certain places, the forest fire, fire pick up naturally because of too much heat, uh, global warming effect. But Indonesia often happen. And then the government of Indonesia is not capable to, to uh, put off the fire on time. So in that, it, it, it not only the, that produce that it produce smoke, smoke which affect the, the Malaysia and the, and, and the neighboring country. And uh, another challenge is that I will see that there's no common uh, uh, cooperation or agreement or any uh, legal harmonization among ASEAN member country on the uh, EIA, like the Environmental Impact Assessment. So the ASEAN company and the ASEAN citizen, the idea, it's there, but how the, when there is no even the EIA principle in the region, the company, it's at the hand of any multinational to do it bilaterally, and with the, the I can raise like a, uh, the company like Sharon or the uh, a couple of the, this foreign company collude with the uh, government because if we talk about the build good relationship with the government to build trust, but the people know they don't like it. I raised the case of Cambodia, for example, like the uh, foreign company, uh, Vietnam, foreign company, Huang An, invested in the rubber plantation in Ratanakiri, got the loan from the IFC, the, and then the community got affected because their land, they used, the, their land they ceased and without any benefit from that development of the rubber plantations, and then they filed a complaint to the government, but they know there's no solution to the issue. Uh, uh, so that loan, really destructive loan for the, the, the natural resources and the, at the destruction of the community. And the communities filed this complaint to the World Bank in Washington. That's uh, around seven years ago that have happened. And then the, 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 the group of Washington accept the, uh, and send their team to study the case. And uh, one more of example, it's the one of the big business company doing the uh, sugar cane plantation in Kampung Spu province, got the loan from uh, ANZ Royal Cambodia that's associated with the Australia. And the reputation of that, because they took the land again, the land issue, and the people have no job. And they export this sugar to the U EU and the US. And then the EU and the US under the Ambassador George Edgar and the um, Ambassador uh, <coughs> William Hyde issued statement that this is the blood sugar. And then it starts from that, that <laughs> bank has a problem, so license now to other, and the uh, company has a problem, and divert this attention to the market in China. I thank you. Thank you. Mr. Zadran, over the last 40 years, the people of Afghanistan have known war, have known <coughs> a number of, of, uh, of conflicts. Aren't they, are they demanding that some of these resources exploration is channeled back to them? How do they make their voices uh, be heard? And is it really, is it time that uh, some of those resources, some of the money that's generated is put on the country in infrastructures and other investments? 
Well, um, yes, um, obviously, as Mr. Paul said, you know, we have to convince our people, right, our communities. So uh, the Afghans uh, are very well aware of, you know, their, uh, their natural resources uh, right now because <coughs> in most of the provinces that, you know, we have the mineral deposits, <coughs> either we have announced the uh, projects or we have the actual projects. Uh, yes, uh, uh, through civil society organi organizations and um, other um, non-governmental organizations, they always uh, they, they consider the same themselves uh, involved in the mining governance in Afghanistan. Uh, by law, yes, uh, whatever we are earning or the revenue that comes from the um, uh, extraction of the natural resources or from the mining on the oil and gas projects, uh, we have a specific provision in our law which says that uh, the eight uh, percent of the revenue from the small scale projects and uh, five percent of the revenue from the large scale uh, projects should go for the community development a part of the general revenue that's uh, distributed uh, um, uh, among uh, 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 many provinces in our uh, national budget uh, i think this is important because uh, the, as I, I stated before, uh, one of the reasons for illegal mining and illegal export of minerals to other countries, particularly to neighbor countries, to our neighbor countries, is that people don't, uh, the people don't have jobs and uh, for a small amount of money, they do the extractions. So most of them know about the extraction. Even another, uh, I would say, a reasonable step that we, heard of, we have taken is we have given an amnesty period of 12 months for the illegal mining in our new mining law. So according to which uh, they can come and ask for a license and formalize uh, their mining. So community is well involved and uh, we do care and we, uh, we have had considered their rights and uh, other issues um, in our laws and regulations. Definitely, the revenue that comes from the uh, mining is a part of the national revenue and it is spent on uh, infrastructure and other development projects. Thank you. Okay. Now back to Portuguese. Yes. Professor Helena Freitas. É da comunidade científica que tem vindo muitos alertas, também muitas soluções para estes problemas de que estamos a falar. Sente que os governos estão a prestar atenção ao que os cientistas dizem, estão a chamá-los para junto de si, para contribuir para, para, para a sustentabilidade? Eu, eu queria começar por dizer também que eu neste momento tenho, sinto a necessidade, o impulso, digamos, também dizer qualquer coisa enquanto cidadã e conhecedora ainda assim de muitos países que estamos aqui a falar. Portanto, de facto, conheço muito bem muitos destes países. E a verdade é que temos visto a luta, esta, digamos, isto é uma, é uma luta profundamente desigual. Estamos a falar de uma relação que é, não é uma luta, uma relação profundamente desigual. Evidentemente que estamos a falar de corporações, de companhias, de, de, digamos, de empresas que têm uma capacidade técnica, tecnológica brutal e que de facto têm, nestes, quase todos estes países, têm recursos naturais que importam e que, evidentemente, que estão, em que, essas, que essas empresas desejam e porque têm que entrar na, na economia global. E, portanto, de facto... Nós temos países que não têm, como já vimos, um nível de organização e muitas vezes precário, portanto, uma capacitação também precária, um nível de organização até entre países, de cooperação entre países, que não está, digamos, que não tem capacidade reativa face a esta pressão, que é uma pressão brutal, portanto, ainda por cima, muito capacitada, porque hoje nós temos tecnologia extraordinária, portanto, hoje não é preciso uma empresa muito capacitada, com tecnologia, não precisa de ir ao país até para conhecer os seus recursos. Não precisa. Hoje nós temos tecnologia que nos permite quantificar e identificar à distância o que é que um país tem. Não é? E, portanto, isto hoje, de facto, a pressão é imensa e o nível... Nós estamos claramente a deixar países e, sobretudo, pessoas, que é o que me incomoda mais profundamente, para trás. Claramente estamos a deixar pessoas para trás. E, portanto, isto é um desafio imenso para, para todos nós e a comunidade científica percebeu claramente e é hoje uma parceira ativa na resolução dos conflitos e na procura de soluções. E não é por acaso, aliás, que a própria Agenda 2030 das Nações Unidas hoje tem uma componente científica profunda. Portanto, hoje 
os, uh, digamos, uh, os, os cientistas, de uma forma geral, são missionários uh, também da causa da sustentabilidade da humanidade, claramente, e, portanto, também estamos a tentar colaborar no sentido de encontrar soluções que respondam. Sendo que, como disse, esta relação é profundamente desequilibrada, e hoje estamos a ver há pouco a questão do Mekong, por exemplo, uma questão onde se vê claramente a dificuldade que encontram na cooperação entre países, de facto também eles com uma capacidade muito desigual de abordar o problema, não têm, por exemplo, uma legislação de impacto ambiental que permita configurar muitas vezes as soluções, as comunidades não sabem e não estão, digamos, por dentro e não têm que estar, portanto têm um nível de preparação que legitimamente não conseguiram ainda encontrar e, portanto, de facto, isto nós estamos permanentemente num limbo também entre a procura, digamos, a um bem, enfim, a procura de um bem-estar mínimo e do conflito, do conflito, porque é uma inevitabilidade, porque quando pomos em causa a segurança alimentar, a, a confiança das pessoas, quando há a falta de, de, de previsão, digamos assim, isto pode acontecer. E portanto eu penso que hoje e, e voltava à questão inicial, talvez não tenha sido muito, muito objetiva, não, nesta, nesta relação tão desigual e dada a urgência, de facto, também dos problemas, eu penso que nós cada vez mais percebemos a necessidade de ter ao nível supra-governamental, portanto, internacional, alguma orientação técnico-política, não é que de facto sirva de inspiração a novos modelos de organização nos territórios, porque aquilo que temos tido, que sabemos e percebemos que não há legitimidade, para evidentemente cada país tem a sua, digamos, a sua autonomia, não é isso que está em causa, mas de facto precisamos de modelos de organização inspiradores de outras dinâmicas que tenham em conta e em primeiro lugar as pessoas, as comunidades porque, de facto, esta questão dos recursos, cada vez mais, é de facto um choque entre uma apetência imediatista, portanto, e de facto economicista por uh, gerir recursos e rapidamente tornar os recursos disponíveis, e o bem-estar mínimo de uma imensa comunidade de pessoas, não é? que de facto precisam da nossa atenção e precisam da nossa colaboração, porque de facto não têm, não têm uh, condições para, para responder àquilo que são, e, e cada vez têm menos, é? e, portanto, e sobretudo num momento de tanta incerteza à escala global. Enfim, temos visto, por exemplo, o que está a acontecer com a profusão de plásticos nos oceanos. Imagina o que isto tem de impacto nos ecossistemas de Mangal, por exemplo, daquela região do mundo da Ásia, não é? E, portanto, de facto, nós precisamos cada vez mais de, 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 facto, de mecanismos que à escala internacional chamem a iniciativa privada, que está cada vez mais disponível, porque também tem consciência que, não é, que a percepção das populações é maior, a comunidade científica também está mais ativa, participa mais, e, portanto, eu estou convencida que nós estamos num momento em que é absolutamente vital para, de facto, não continuarmos a deixar mais pessoas para trás, portanto, de facto e a não construirmos aquilo que hoje é um mundo profundamente desigual, nós precisamos, com o apoio da ciência, da tecnologia, mas também da iniciativa privada, das empresas que hoje estão mais receptivas a uma nova ética, não é? da, 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 até de, 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 de princípio, da, de atividade, não é? e construirmos realmente uh, uh, esses, esses outros modelos. As universidades têm aqui um papel muito importante, a academia, estamos aqui dois representantes, nós, de facto, estamos disponíveis para participar também com as estruturas locais, regionais, e ajudarmos a construir modelos em que, de facto, o conhecimento também possa servir de apoio às novas soluções que necessariamente têm que envolver as comunidades, respeitar a sua condição, seja ela qual for, não é? e com as pessoas construir, de facto, soluções não é? que possam, de facto, trazer mais bem-estar para todos, porque senão este mundo que estamos a construir, de facto, não vale a pena. Não é? E, portanto, não pode ser. Isto não é possível. O mundo que tem cada vez mais conhecimento não é compatível com um mundo tão desigual e em tanta desarmonia, digamos, geral. E, portanto, eu penso que é por aqui, é pelo envolvimento das empresas em novas soluções, pelo apoio da ciência, assim, sem dúvida, do conhecimento também para programas. Por exemplo, falávamos há pouco da questão energética, evidentemente que é vital, porque se nós conseguirmos soluções de energia limpa nestes países, estamos a a baixar brutalmente a fatura que as famílias têm 
não há dúvida. E, portanto, precisamos desses programas, programas concertados com as comunidades, indo, de facto, às regiões, e programas que tragam, de facto, outra orientação também de funcionamento, de dia a dia, porque, de facto, isto assim, penso que, porque já vimos, quer dizer, isto é profundamente desigual. Não há, não há, não há hipótese, quer dizer, de, de, digamos, com o mesmo modelo, não vamos lá. Isso, era essa nota final que queria dar. Muito obrigado.